Hi, good afternoon. I'm Yu from Microsoft Research. As you know, air pollution is now becoming a global concern, particularly in developing countries like China. Governments have built many on-the-ground air quality monitoring stations to inform people their ambient air quality every hour. For example, what's the concentration of NO2, what's the concentration of PM2.5? Okay. Oh. Okay, so um, air pollution, headache, China. Okay, now we're going to solve this problem. Make it short, okay? Um, besides monitoring real-time air quality, there's a rising demand on forecasting the air quality in the near future. So what's the air quality going to be tomorrow, okay? So in this project, we forecast air quality for each monitoring station. And particularly for the next six hours, we predict a real value number for each hour. And for the next 7 to 12, 13 to 24, 24 to 48, we predict a range of minimal and the maximal air quality index. So we emphasize this is a fan green prediction instead of generally saying tomorrow is good or not. We predict for each air quality monitoring station and it's also a, tem fan, a temporal fan granularity. Okay? And we also predict for each kind of air pollutants. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of data we're using? We use three types of data. First, the air quality data of a station. Second, the real-time meteorological data, such as wind, uh, wind speed, temperature, humidity, etc. And third is the weather forecast. But I want to emphasize, we don't only use the data of the station we are going to predict. We also use the data of other stations around the station we are going to predict. In the experiments, we use the station around 300 kilometers uh, to the station we are going to pre predict. So this figure shows how many stations we are using to predict the air quality of Beijing. And this is a, air, uh, this is a monitor, uh, meteorological monitoring stations we are using. So that's the three types of data we're using, but not only for a single station. We use all the station data. So this is how system looks like. Um, it's a real system that have, has been deployed on BMAP and also in Chinese uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection. So if you click, it's not working. Okay. If you click um, a station, you will see what's the air quality of this particular location going to be. Um, for the first six hours, it's a continuous value, but for the other time slots, it's a range with a minimum and max. With such kind of information, you can make your own decision whether we can go hiking tomorrow, and government can make some decision on traffic control or pollution control. So they can save a lot of money for, for government. Um, as I said, it's a real system based on a framework that combines cloud with client. Well, cloud continuous collects real-time information such as air quality data and the meteorological data, processing the data and provide the user with forecasts. The user can access information of air quality forecasts by either using a mobile client or a website. So the mobile client has been released. Uh, we currently, we have uh, Android and Windows Phone version and iOS is coming very soon. And we don't do any promotion so far, but the daily access uh, of this service is 4 million per day. So you can see how many people are using the service. It's real. And we also deploy this system in Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection. So it's, it's real, okay? Um, so what's the challenge of this method of our own technology? Um, first, we know air pollution is influenced by multiple complex factors, such as traffic flow, uh, factory emission, but we don't really have accurate information of each factor. For example, we know traffic flow will generate some pollution emission from vehicles, but we cannot track the emission from each vehicle.
So how can we generate accurate prediction based on inaccurate input? So that's the first challenge. And second challenge, as you see in this um, animation, each icon stands for one air quality monitoring station. And the number associated with each icon means air quality index. You can say even at the same moment, the reading from different stations can be very different, even if they are very close to each other. Because air pollution is in, uh, maybe generated by multiple sources and affected by uh, different kinds of factors. And this factor may be different in different city of, of, the, of, of, of different cities. So we cannot generate one model to predict every location of a city. We have to build a specific model for each particular station. That means you have very few training data. If we can aggregate this data from all the stations, we have much more data to use. But if you try to separate them, then you have even sparse data. Now how can we solve this problem? The sad challenge is we have some inflection point. Supposing this is a store market, you know how important that we can, uh, important is we need to predict the inflection point. But for the air quality is also important. There's a true story. Uh, during the APEC conference, there's two days, uh, there was two days, the air pollution reached about 100 air quality index. And government is trying to make a decision whether we need to do a wider range of pollution control, which means we need to shut down more factories with a further distance to Beijing. But if we know the air quality tends to be becomes good, then it's not necessary to shut down any factories. It will save billions of dollars per day. So that's the importance. But the occurrence of such kind of inflation, uh, inflection point is very minor. They are very infrequent in the data. Um, according to the uh, statistic, in the past one and a half years, only one person, uh, one point two percent instance, are truly a sudden drop instance, uh, the inflection points. If you train a model to predict all the data, the minority will be dominated by majority. So you cannot predict such kind of minority by only using one model. So that's the difficulty of the uh, project. And how we solve it, we, we have a multi-view based framework, learning framework, which is comprised of four major components. Um, spatial predictor, temporal predictor, uh, prediction um, aggregator, and inflection predictor. So the spatial predictor predicts air quality of a location in terms of the data from its neighborhoods. So it's kind of a spatial view, okay? And the temporal predictor predicts air quality of a location in terms of its own data. What is the historic data and what's the future uh, forecast? Okay, so this is temporal view. And we, as we have two predictions and how we can dynamically aggregate them. We cannot use some static factors like uh, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Sometimes spatial view is more important. For example, if the wind speed is very high, the air pollutants may be blown from one city to another city. But sometimes temporal view is more important because there are some local emissions from factories. So we have to learn a dynamic combination to combine the results from the two predictor uh, aggregate, uh, dynamically. So this is a, this component uh, four. And we, as I said, we cannot use a general model to predict the inflection point because they are minority and very infrequent in the data. So we build, a, we train a separate inflection prediction model to predict inflection point. We also learn some criteria. When such kind of criteria are satisfied, we invoke this predictor and generate um, additional uh, drop, inf uh, drop and append to the final results. So that's how the uh, entire system works. Now I will elaborate on each of them. So why we use such kind of framework instead of putting all the features into a single linear regression or a neural network. There are three reasons. From the um, features view, they are separate uh, data sets. They have non-overlap features used by different predictors, standing for temporal view and spatial view. They have semantic millions. Second, the model has different properties. For spatial views, it's more like an interpolation problem. And for temporal views, more like a regression problem. So you have to treat them using different models instead of using one model. And also, according to the uh, training data, the size of training data, we don't have too many training data. 
for weather forecast prediction, we may have 50 years data, but for air quality prediction, we only have two years data. So if we put all the features together, that means you come up with a very huge model with many parameters to learn. Given a very small sample of data, you cannot train such a model perfectly. So that's the reason why we use such kind of framework instead of using a simple linear regression or neural network. This is how the temporal predictor works. It's based on new, uh, linear regression, taking into account the data of the station itself. For example, we put the air quality data and the uh, meteorological data of past few hours, hours as input into a regression model to predict its future air quality. We train different models for different hours for future time. Okay, that's how temporal predictor works. For a spatial predictor, um, it predicts air quality of a location in terms of its neighborhood station's data. data. So particularly, suppose S is the location, the station we are going to predict, okay? We draw three circles with different uh, diameters. Then we later, we partition the space by four lines resulting in eight directions, standing for different wind directions, okay? The general idea is if the reading from this station tends to be bad, and we know the wind speed comes through this way, we know a couple of hours later, the air quality of this location tends to be bad. This is a general idea, but it's not that simple because the meteorological data of different regions may be very controversial. Okay, so we further we aggregate data for in each region. For example, we can calculate the average air quality in each region because in each region there may be multiple air quality stations uh, located. So we can also calculate the average humidity for each region. Now we get some aggregation data for each region. The reason why we do such kind of partition and aggregation lies in two aspects. The first, we can reduce the number of inputs. Um, supposing if we directly put all the data into a model, given a 300 kilometer distance, there might be hundreds of stations located. And each location, uh, each station may generate a couple of features like humidity, temperature. That means we will have thousands of features input for a training model. So that's too huge. So after such kind of aggregation, we only have 24 regions at the most. So that will reduce the number of inputs and generate more accurate prediction results. The second reason is if we don't do aggregation, there might be some contradictory results in a feature input in each region. For example, supposing there are two uh, meteorological monitoring stations, the wind direction from the two stations might be opposite. One station saying it's going to the north, and another saying going to the south, because um, the wind is shaped by the city canyon. So we have to aggregate them to reduce some noise information and put them into a neural network. So we can use the input or, or use a feature from this region as a feature, as an input, throw them into the neural network and generate a prediction for the air quality of this location. So this is a special predictor. Then we have an aggregator based on regression tree. As I said, sometimes um, spatial information is more important. Sometimes temporal information is more important. So we learn a such kind of structure based on regression tree. So here's one real example we learn from data. When wind speed is very low, uh, tend to be low, then we use such kind of combination. It's learned from data. When the wind speed is high, we give spatial prediction at higher weight. Higher weight. So this framework uh, structure is learned from data. Now we can uh, try to introduce how we can predict the sudden drops, the inflection points. Um, as I said, it's uh, very infrequent in the data, only 1.2%. So we cannot predict such kind of situation by general model. So we train a separate model to predict such kind of situation. So let me demonstrate how we train that. So supposing each point stands for one air quality instance we observe from the station. And the red point means the true sudden drops, that means true inflection points. So we first select the points of true sudden drops. And then we see the distribution of each feature in this data set and in the entire data set. And we see the difference of distribution. We've identified such kind of range as a candidate. Then according to a uh, objective function, we find a set of features as criteria to retrieve such kind of sudden drops. 
in ideal case, what we can retrieve is, is a mixture of real job or non job. Then we use such kind of uh, suppression threshold to retrieve the data DT and use this data as training set to train a model. Okay. Later, given a new feature, a new new instance, if the feature of the instance satisfies the category of the uh, suppression thresholds, we retrieve or we invoke the inflection model and we generate an additional job and append this additional job to the prediction of the framework. Okay, let's see this slide. So we evaluate our data. Um, this is the data we are collecting in our real system. So it is quite a lot, okay? Um, this is a data we are we use to evaluate our methods, okay? We release the data sets. You can download um, the data from the link. I, I put the link on my paper, okay? So this is the result. Um, we evaluate them uh, in the paper in five cities of China, but now we have deployed in 61 cities of China. So we can see this is Guangzhou's black one. It's the prediction. Uh, and the red one is going to choose. They are quite accurate. In terms of accuracy, in Beijing, we can achieve 75% accurate. So if the ground choose is 100 and prediction is 75, then the accuracy is 75. So it's pretty accurate. I skipped some results. Um, and we compare our method with different methodologies. What if we put all the information into a single model? What if we don't have an inflection point? And this is our methodology. You can see we can achieve significant improvement beyond only using a single model or only using one view. We also compare our methodology with traditional uh, weather forecasting prediction model. So we can achieve much better results in terms of um, accuracy and absolute error. And then we can predict even faster. Traditional model needs need six hours to predict the next few hours, but we can achieve um, the prediction in a few seconds for the entire city. So let's do a summary. We deploy a real system to forecast air quality, fan green for, uh, forecast uh, for in over 61 cities in, in China. Um, it's a multi-view based learning framework, which is much better than using a single model and a traditional weather forecast model. And we have apps, websites released, and data released. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we have time for one question. Yes, right in uh, orange. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It seems to me that you encounter a classical curse of dimensionality problems when you have lots of um, huge number of predictors and basically not enough samples to test your model. Have you tried to use regularized regression instead of using multiple linear regression? Yeah, so the reason why we use multiple model instead of a single model is the data training data is not that big. We have two years data, but two years data is considered small as compared to traditional weather forecasts. They have 50 years data. So if you have a model with a, a huge number of parameters to learn, you need more data. Otherwise, it will result in overfitting. So multi view, by using multi view, we separate the feature into multi, many small models each of which has a small number of parameters to learn. So given such kind of training data, we can learn each model accurately. Later, by combining them, we can result in a much better results. So that's the general idea. Yeah. Oh, I Yeah, I, we compare that. We know that they will do some selection, but when the data is very sparse, there are, are some redundancy between different features, and their features are not really uh, independent each other. So that's a reason uh, why we should use um, multi-view learning. So yeah. Okay. So for further question, we will take those online. So let's thank you again. Yep.